you have the power to reach somebody through music regardless of their culture. It's just a matter of figuring out the best way to do that culturally and be sensitive to their musical history in, in whatever kind of market you're going for. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. I'm your host, Jody Krangle, and this podcast will discuss just how sound influences our behavior. I generally talk about this in the context of advertising and marketing, but there are other places this is important too. I really feel that it plays a much more important role in our lives than maybe we realize. So let's delve a little deeper. This is the second part of my interview with Nick Crane. For um, music composition especially, I would think, um, being able to speak in the client's language would be really uh, kind of needed because you need to be able to tell your client what they should be hearing or what they should be looking for as far as what they want for their commercial or film, um, you know, emotive music, the type of instruments. Um, and I have to ask, like, how do you relate this kind of stuff to your clients? Because your language musically would be far different from theirs, I would, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love this question because it's, it's like really ubiquitous to what I do and other people that mm -hmm. do what I do. Um, and I'm sure everybody has a slightly different answer, but what I've found is the one great method, um, which is super counterintuitive is to talk about things in terms of emotions, mm -hmm. which you think would be really subjective, you know, because emotions and music are both really subjective things and how, mm -hmm. what music makes different people feel is very person to person. So it sounds like you're piling subjectivity on subjectivity and that could get confusing. <laughs> yeah, sure. But it works. It really does. Mm -hmm. If you talk about what the you know what my client wants to feel when they hear this music, that's the quickest way for me to get to what they need. And if we start talking about, do you want to hear violins? Do you want to hear strings? Do you want to hear, well, violins are strings. Do you want to hear piano? Do you want to hear guitar? Do you want this <laughs> mm -hmm. to be an electric beat? You know, hip hop genre, even you know any specifics. You have to have those conversations, but those terms are just as subjective as anything else. And mm -hmm. for some reason, when I talk about emotions and, and how you want to feel and really describing the, the specifics of that emotion and that feeling, it gets closer to the story they want to tell. And it gives me a, it gives me a quicker lane to get to where they want to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, it does. It makes a lot of sense, actually. So my next question is actually, um, how much does this change depending on where they are in the world? Because obviously, you know, in North America, we have different sensibilities than, say, Great Britain or, you know, like um, sure. there's there's, you know, places around the world that use different types of instruments to emote different emotions. Um, so yeah, I'm curious how that changes depending on where your client is located. Have you noticed anything like that? Oh yeah. No, that's a huge, that's a huge variable. Mm -hmm. Um, my experience has been primarily just the U S and then London, I, I'm sorry, not London, but England, you know, um, mm -hmm. Great Britain, mm -hmm. the UK. And I've done, I've done one spot, um, for China and, I'm trying to think if I've done any more. One for France. Okay. And that's the extent of my experience. But within, Did you find them different? within the US alone, there are kind of musical dialects from sure. the north to the yeah. south to the east to the west that are that mm -hmm. provide enough difficulty with this. And and I don't know. Uh it's challenging. Um certainly mm. within you know, for instance, um I would say between between countries, it's bigger between, you know, obviously the bigger the distance, the bigger the divide is going to be, the bigger the cultural distance. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed it really significantly between the U.S. and the U.K. There's a huge difference in terminology and, and what things mean to a lesser extent, but on the same scale, the South versus the North. I, I've been doing a lot of work with Southern agencies recently. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's more of a subtle shift, but you have to note it, you know, um, and it just, it's just about identifying what they like, what they listen to, asking questions about 
what they're into, what, you know, uh, getting their suggestions for things to kind of figure out where their head's at and then working within that mindset versus my own because obviously I am a very specific person with specific tastes that are weird and different from other people and not for everybody. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I really try to get myself in the, in the, in the client's headspace to get them happy. I also have yeah. a, um, I have a composer that I work with who's, um, from China and he's most of his experiences with the Chinese market. And he just moved to Brooklyn, uh, last year. Wow. And That's a big change. <laughs> yeah. He's incredibly talented. He's really great. He pl- he's a, Super, cla- he's classically trained, mm-hmm. orchestral, really multi instrumentalist. He can do everything. He can do it quickly. He's just really a really talented guy, but his sensibilities are so different from that of my clients. You know, and I, I tell him one thing, and he comes back to me with something that's beautiful, but like in this very strange way that I I, I, I completely associate with a cultural divide. You know, it's mm-hmm. and so we've been working together to like get him kind of educated on what people here like and what people here mean by different things and what's just for lack of a better word popular yeah and it's uh it's I don't know it's a process but it's it's working out well but it is a hurdle to overcome yeah it it sounds really interesting though I guess you're getting sort of a crash course on on you know the Chinese different sensibility of music (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's super interesting because it's it it is really quite different. Hmm. Yeah, we think of music as a kind of universal language, I guess, and in a way, I think it can be. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely different sensibilities as far as what instruments are used, what um, tonal progressions, I guess, happen. Um, you yep. know, the the popularity of certain music in certain places. Yeah. Yep. It's, no, really I mean, I, it's, it's interesting what you just said, that music is the universal language, but there are these things. And that's that's what it is. These are nuances. They mm-hmm. exist. They're differences. But at the end of the day, there is an objectivity to music. And that's something that a lot of people don't say very often. And mm-hmm. I really believe in it. I think there is an objective emotional response to different combinations of notes and harmonies and melodies that is universal and is objective across any culture mm-hmm. because it's it's almost physical. And if you can accept that there is that level of objectivity in music, but also cultural and experiential subjectivity, you know, it's not one or the other. There's both. Yeah. And I just think yeah. that's a point you don't hear too often. And it's important to point it out. I agree. Yeah. And it's a it's a really interesting point, because when we're talking specifically about audio branding, because that's what we talk about here. Yeah, good, <laughs> um, good call back. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> uh, when we talk about that, then it sort of lends this really interesting extra bit to the whole reason behind audio branding. And that is that you don't need to know someone's language to reach them on an emotional level. So that's Totally That's true. really important. You know, if you're trying to get a message across and you don't know the language of the people that are hearing your message, um, then, yeah, music is is a really great way to reach their heart really quickly. Yes, um, I agree. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very powerful tool, but mm-hmm. a tricky one. Yes. Yeah. Now, explain to me what you mean by tricky when you say that. <laughs> well, it's just, just an extension of what we've been talking about. I mean, it's... Mm-hmm. It's the the fact that every culture has some form of music, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Music music exists everywhere in every culture, and it and people react to it emotionally in every culture. Mm-hmm. It serves the same function, but they're also nuanced and different. So you have the power to reach somebody through music, regardless of their culture. It's just a matter of figuring out the best way to do that culturally and be sensitive to their musical history and and whatever kind of market you're going for um yeah and that that kind of leads to the idea of having i think we talked about this before but um when we were chatting but like the the idea of taking one kind of mnemonic or brand anthem song and kind of tweaking it for different cultures but yeah we were talking about this 
Yeah, we were talking about this in the context of MasterCard because right. part of part of what they've done with their signature sound is that they've translated it across many different cultures in many different countries. And that's part of, I think, why it cost them $15 million to do. <laughs> they spent a serious load of coin on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's, like I said, it's tricky. You know, it's yeah. a very tough little thing to to pull off but if you can do it it's an extremely extremely effective marketing thing you know it's it's a great technique and yeah. it's, music is the most memorable part of a lot of a lot of branded content yeah yeah very true and i think if anyone can pull it off mastercard will be the one to do it <laughs> well you, you would you would hope that they have the resources and and you know connections to to figure that out and get the right people involved I guess we'll see over time how that works out. Um, yeah. Have you ever had to do a project that has sort of reached over different, um, uh, almost different cultural um, experiences? Like, have you had a particular um, campaign that you've had to do music for that was playing both in the South and the North, for instance? Well, Yes. But I've never been challenged to customize the same piece of music for two different demographics. I see. So they just went with something that would be good for both. Yeah. Or that they assumed I mean, I wish I had a better answer both. to that, but no, I, have, <laughs> I haven't in my experience. Uh, but I'd yeah. like to. And uh, the closest thing I can think of is I did a campaign for um, one client where they wanted the same song, the same anthem that we had demoed mm -hmm. for them. And they, they decided this is, this is going to be our track. They wanted to apply it to eight different uh, personalities in eight different commercials. Oh. And so we, okay. we had the challenge of customizing the track to have different an alternate version for each different personality that they were featuring. So, mm -hmm. you know, one person was, you know, riding their bike through the forest and another person was out in a farm and, and another person was swimming in the ocean. And, and so... We, we wanted the instrumentation and the music to reflect what they were doing, but it would still be the same composition. That's a really interesting... Which is very much the same exercise, but just not... Yeah, very much. Geographic. Yeah, you know? very cool. <laughs> very, very and cool. And that was fun. That was, that was great, you know, because that, that, that's when you really start identifying what instruments people associate with different things. Yeah, that is a really interesting sensibility, too, that uh, I wouldn't have thought of um, before you mentioned it, that different instruments would denote different things, different um, actions, different uh, locations. Yeah, in a big way. Yeah. yeah in, sure. in what sense have you found that particular um, function? Is there a particular instrument that goes with the ocean, for instance? Like, is there... Absolutely. And it's exactly yeah. what you'd think it would be, you know? Uh -huh. It's like marimbas, you know? Like things that you... <laughs> okay. If you think of like the corniest like island scene in any movie. <laughs> yeah. And the most obvious thing that that's what people associate with. It's not really uh, a really advanced science. It's it's actually about kind of taking a step back as a musician, mm -hmm. closing your mind a little bit instead of opening your mind and yeah. just thinking what somebody who doesn't think of music, what, what are they referencing, you know, when they when they see okay. or hear something. And a lot so of what's times the cliche? What's the cliche? Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> that's what most people are going to think of. And that's where mm -hmm. their imagination is going to go. So, you know, um, maybe it's maybe it's a little ukulele. Maybe it's some marimbas. Maybe it's <laughs> it's it's super cultural stuff. And yeah, the thing is, when I'm composing music that's not specific to a geography or personality and this is not the challenge, I'm just doing a regular job where mm -hmm. they're giving me a story to tell. A lot of times the comments and the feedback I get are that they're getting a sense from a certain instrument that's not fitting with their story. Uh, for instance, oh. I literally just got this comment yesterday that mm -hmm. part of a track for this uh, for this um, jewelry brand that I was working with, um, part of the track felt Christmassy. Oh, OK. You know? Why would they have come to that conclusion? Well, it turns out it was there was a combination of of bells and flute and strings that I was using that oh. leaned a little. It kind of crossed that border into Christmas Town by accident, and <laughs> as soon as they said it, I heard it, and I was you know, I was okay. like, yep, you know, you're right, you're right, that's okay. it. So it's just about changing the instrumentation, but we kept the composition exactly the same, and it it solved it for them. That's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I guess when we were talking previously, you mentioned a campaign that you did for TikTok. Um, oh, yeah. Can you can you talk a little about that and, and how did that come about and, and how did it end up or are you not done with it? <laughs> no, it's done. I don't know if they ever, ever showed it. That was a funny one. Um, I mean, they did. They, they ran it for a little bit, but TikTok is, you know, I, I'm I'm getting into a little bit of trouble talking about this, but <laughs> they, they, I think they were they were really trying to figure out their brand identity. Uh-huh. Um, and I think that, you know, the a lot of times the creative agency that hires me is at odds with their client about what that mm-hmm. is. And so we're we're kind of on this ride together to figure it out. I think um, social media in general can be a little tricky that way, too, because mm-hmm. it's so much composed of the people that use it. That, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, TikTok you know, is a great example of that. Yeah. 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 So I can I totally understand why they might have some trouble figuring out what their brand voice is, because it consists of so many people. <laughs> sure. And the easiest the easiest part of the process was um, was using Old Town Road, because that was a song that got made popular through TikTok. Oh, OK. People were doing uh-huh. the dance to it. And yeah, it probably wouldn't have been as popular without TikTok. And so sense, um, yeah. I think that was that's just one part of the commercial. And they were trying to figure out how to do the rest of the commercial. I'm like, what mm-hmm. should the music sound like that? Should it be different? And that's where that's where it gets trickier. And I we ended up using a, a song by a, this is, a, again, a story where I'm a fan of somebody. And then I think of them for a spot and I call them up mm-hmm. and say, hey, do you want to work on a commercial? <laughs> You know, (laughs) and the answer is most of the time, yes, because they're a Mm -hmm. musician and they need money. And then all of a sudden I'm getting to work with this person I've been a fan of for years. In this case, it's a it's a guy named Josh Ocean, who um, is part of a group called Nudes. And he's a fantastic um, electronic musician and just like just a really great beat maker. And just uh, he's doing a lot of great stuff. That Um, sounds like it would be pretty perfect for TikTok. But, uh, you know. Well, know. yeah, that's that's what they ended up choosing. I mean, we went through a mm-hmm. lot of options. They knew they wanted something electronic. They knew they wanted something that was a little like like modern um, and popular with youth culture, but not necessarily trap. We did explore trap yeah. quite a bit because that was kind of what they, they felt their demographic would respond to the most. Mm-hmm. But then a lot of trap is just really negative and they mm. wanted to be positive, too. So electronic kind of modern using a lot of the same production elements that uh, a trap song might, but in a, in a kind of a more positive, upbeat, maybe slightly dancey way, ended up being mm-hmm. kind of the perfect solution. And that's what Nudes is. I mean, Nudes is like really pristine, modern, slightly experimental production values, mm-hmm. super catchy stuff. And, uh, and yeah, I got, to, I got to work with Josh on that, and, and uh, it was fun. It was good. It worked out. But then, you know in terms of what we were talking about earlier about some brands who really know their identity and some brands who don't, I think Mm -hmm. about a month later, they put out a a new spot with different music that I didn't work on. That was completely different, you know, just a whole different tone, complete shift because they're just trying to figure out what that voice is. Yeah. I I will say though, that um, uh, just so that you don't completely lose heart, (laughs) um, (laughs) uh, I have often been called upon to do a voice uh, for a particular commercial that they use briefly and then shelve for months and then all of a sudden put back on the air. Mm, mm. So it may be that they come back to it at some point. Um, yeah. No, I've had a you that experience know. too. And it's always a, yeah. a nice bonus, you know, it's, it's yeah. really a nice bonus. Exactly. A nice surprise <laughs> when somebody switches back to the idea that you were part of. Yeah. Yeah. And, it does and you happen. never know when it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it Especially the voiceover, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it, and especially with some union stuff, actually, because they they sort of have to pay for it anyway. <laughs> so they may as well use it. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. You got to like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's also it's it's uh, I guess that's the benefit of working with somebody who doesn't know their identity yet, because maybe they they work on something with you. They love it. And uh, the next month somebody else comes in. And they say, no, we got to change things up. They try that. doesn't work. So they go right back to what they know worked at one point. So it yeah, can go, it can you go never in any know. direction of any, any uh, variation of ways. Yeah. 
So what are the, um, you were mentioning the options that they have as far as the music composition is concerned. So um, I guess that goes from, they could find some track on a license-free um, directory all the way up to um, dealing directly with um, a composer who makes something custom for them or an artist who already has something. Um, so there's like a whole bunch of different options for people to take on yeah. this. Yeah. Um, do you do you find that certain companies go in certain directions? Like, is there a, a, a certain type of uh, in, like larger companies would be more inclined to um, to pay an artist or um, smaller companies might go with a directory or do you think it varies? Yeah, no, I think I think you're right on. I think I think money plays a big part in it. Mm -hmm. And I think people are scared of music and when the budget gets involved, they're even more scared of it. And they just, they just want to make sure that they're not overspending and they have a lot of preconceptions about working with a more established artist or mm -hmm. doing something bespoke or whatever it is, you know, they just, they tend to think, oh, we can only afford this. And it it's, it's not often the case you know i mean there's a lot of ways to do it that's that's my mm -hmm. point you can do it in a lot of ways you can do a search you can do a composition you can do multiple compositions you could do you could do you could find i mean there's just so many ways to go about it um and i think people often are limited in their thinking because they think they don't have the time or the money to do something or the, or they think that they're too small a brand to have a big name artist attached to them and they don't Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily realize that there's a lot of ways to go about it. So the the important thing is just to keep an open mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And I think, um, you know, to your question, the, the bigger the brand, the more experience they have with this stuff. Yeah. The more they understand those options and the, the more effective their branding becomes because they know they can explore different ideas. They, there's all these ways to do it. Smaller brands, they just don't have the experience with music they figure they can't afford different routes of doing things. And for whatever reason, they end up sticking with, uh, for lack of a better word, more mundane options because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can see how that would, you know, how their experience would lend to them deciding to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. It's been um, suggested to me when I, when I've done research on audio branding, that it's a good idea to get something custom made for yourself precisely because then that sort of belongs to your brand and can't kind of be taken away from you in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Like I know, for instance, that some brands who use, um, you know, royalty free, free music might find someone else using that royalty free music <laughs> for their spot. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're like, you know, oh, okay, well, I guess my audio branding is down the toilet. <laughs> yeah, it's over before it began. Yeah. It's like, it seems obvious, but that's what happens when you let, you know, your financial situation kind of dictate your thinking on things. And, and the fact is you don't have to pay a ton to get original composition done. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of talented musicians out there trying to make a living at this thing, trying to make music. It's it's just about talking to somebody who has the experience to connect you with the right person. Yeah, and you would be that person. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I mean, well, <laughs> it's kind of why I we're talking. So. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so what are you working yeah. on right now? Um, well, actually, a lot of COVID stuff. Uh, of mean, course. Unsurprisingly, that yeah. is everybody's trying to get their own message on about Sorry, their own message out about this, mm -hmm. and um, that's that's it's just been an incredible shift where everything's been super focused into this one idea that yeah. all these companies are doing a different version of. You know, yeah, which is uh, on the one hand very important. Uh, I think getting positive messaging out, depending on the messaging, mm -hmm. is great and can be really good. And in, in most cases, it's it's very real and positive. I've found that. Uh, brands are doing the right thing with this and promoting very basic messages about, you know, washing your hands and staying at home and, <laughs> yeah. and the right stuff. Um, but yeah, everybody's kind of saying the same thing at the same time. And so the challenge has, has been to really find that unique angle 
and mm-hmm. so make something memorable out of it. So that's what I'm up to these days. I, I have a couple ongoing projects that ha- started before this all happened that were already shot um, that are st- still haven't shipped yet because they're still in post. So I've been mm-hmm. working on some of that old stuff too that's more traditional. Mm-hmm. But because of the limitations on on gatherings uh, and groups and, and things, you know, you can't go out and shoot a commercial right now. You just can't do it. Yeah. So everything's shifting to existing footage, stock footage, CG. Of course, that all st- still needs music. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of it is specific to the current climate. And so the big yeah. the big game right now is uh, is finding ways to be original. In the <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, that is definitely the big question because I I think it's time. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say I don't know who did it, but that under pressure spot I, I forget what the brand <laughs> I, I can't give any specifics, but I saw yeah. it. I was just like, that's it. That's how you do it. Yeah, yeah. I think also maybe we need a little humor right now too. Like I'm 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 ready to sure. stop crying. <laughs> yeah, positivity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what we need to stop yeah. all this panic. It's like yeah, I really believe in that. Um, and just this, you know, so just. Yeah, I agree. Well, music can be completely up- uplifting as far as all of this is concerned. So I, I love that idea of going in a different direction. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we need. Yeah. Like, we need to be uplifted. We need to be positive and proactive and productive mm-hmm. and and not get sucked into this kind of mopiness that is just everywhere in, yes. this, in this country and in, in the world right now. Yeah. Because that's that's no way to be. No, no, we don't we don't need that right now. <laughs> So how can people find you on the uh, internet and, and elsewhere on social media? Um, so you can check out the work at racketclub.tv. Um, we're and, and it's racket. racket dot... Yeah, it's R-A-C-K-E-T, right? <laughs> oh, thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll make that mistake. It's racket like, what's that racket? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I like it. <laughs> <But> Very clever. <laughs> I, I, ah, it's cute. I don't know. But uh, yeah, Racket Club with the CK. Uh, dot tv is our website where you can see all all of our latest work and you can get our phone number and my email and everything and mm-hmm. uh and then of course on instagram we're racket.club.music um and that's about it okay wonderful well thank you so much for talking with me today i really appreciate it <laughs> oh my god thank you this has been really fun <laughs> yeah it was great thanks Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, please take a moment to give the podcast a review. It's greatly appreciated and super helpful. Until next time.